Okay, this video is the debate about fructose, and I'm going to show several different points of view about fructose. It's rather interesting. We're not going to cover everything about fructose. It's a big subject, but I think we'll cover the key points uh, to make some sense out of what's useful for us. Okay, so, yeah, I know I should have shaved. I, I don't, when I, on this big picture, you notice it more. I don't even think about it usually. I don't like shaving. Nobody, no guys do. All right, so anyways, the average male since 1870 has gained over 50 pounds, going up from a BMI of 23 to 29. And these slides right here are from Chris Knob. Chris Knob is an ophthalmologist physician, and he's associated like with sort of these uh, pro meat eating groups. And that, that's relevant because the persons who think that meat is good to eat and animal foods, they will tend to demonize either fructose, you know, sugars, or they'll tend to demonize um, omega-6 cooking oils. And he's a very bright guy, so he sees omega-6 cooking oils as the main uh, cause of so much obesity in the modern world here. Okay. All right, so now this is Chris Knob here. That's him, Chris Knob. He says, obesity and diabetes have escalated in direct proportion to seed oil consumption there is little or no relationship to sugar consumption. So that's actually a, a big statement. That's very different than what uh, many others are saying. Okay, now I'm showing you the guys who are sort of demonizing uh, fructose. This is uh, Robert Lustig, very famous guy. He gave some you know, uh, talk like the, the bitter truth about sugar and uh, became, there was like 10 million views. Um, this is Richard Johnson. So he, by the way, is a pediatric endocrinologist who did work with a lot of obese uh, pediatric patients. This is Richard Johnson. He's a nephrologist, and he was interested in studying what is the role of uric acid in hypertension. And so they're all going to come through. So Lessig will say things. And he's a rather dramatic, entertaining speaker. Now, don't get me wrong. I think he exaggerates how bad fructose and sugar are. But he's still, he's a very bright guy. Um, he says, why are pediatric patients more obese than ever? Why are we now seeing fatty liver and diabetes type 2 in pediatric patients? And he's going to blame it primarily on fructose. Okay, Richard Johnson, he's going to explain why uric acid uh, helps cause, when it's elevated, causes hypertension. Um, and by the way, having elevated cortisol, being stressed out, increases the appetite for sweets. We've all had times when we're stressed out and we crave sweets. Okay, then they're going to push it to a higher level and say, well, gee, is fructose one of the major contributors to the causation of Alzheimer's? And I'll explain the mechanism why they suggest that. Okay, first of all, we got to do a little bit of basic um metabolism on fructose. We're actually going to do more later in this lecture, but I'll just make the point that when you eat, glucose comes into your gut, goes into your blood, and it goes everywhere in your body. It's the main food for your brain. It's used by organ systems all over your body, but it's not like that with fructose. Almost all the fructose, the vast majority of it goes right to the liver. So it goes from the gut through the portal vein right to the liver. So the portal vein just means the portal is like a connection between the gut and the liver. Okay, the gut and the liver this way. All right, so anyways, the unique thing about fructose is when it's metabolized in the liver, it hits glycolysis, the metabolism pathway for sugars, the anaerobic metabolism pathway for sugars. It hits it at the midpoint, at the three carbon phase. So glucose, here's glucose coming in, let's say through the hepatic artery. It'll come in and it'll be phosphorylated. And then the key point is this PFK. PFK is phosphofructokinase and that's a highly regulated enzyme. So that's a big deal. Basically, the liver is very skilled at handling glucose. It only burns it for energy when it needs energy. It does not want to waste any glucose. The main job of the liver is making sure the brain has enough glucose. So that PFK is tightly, tightly regulated in multiple ways. All right, so nothing happens with glucose unless the liver has a good reason and wants it to happen. It's not like that with fructose. With fructose, you can get a bolus of fructose hitting the liver and then it, 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 it comes into the cycle, the glycolysis cycle of reactions at the midpoint, at the three carbon phase. So it starts out, glucose and fructose start out as six carbon sugars, but then they get, you know, the fructose gets chopped in half and becomes a three carbon sugar and then it speeds on down to the end of the pathway. It'll form pyruvate, then something called acetyl-CoA, which is a two carbon unit. Um, like acetic acid, like vinegar, you know, and the two carbon unit is then run through the Krebs cycle and then run through the mitochondria, um, electron transport chain, 
and what's called oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP. That's how the vast majority of energy is made in the human body. Okay, what's relevant about it though is fructose, it uniquely just goes right to the liver and then hits the three carbon phase. There's no significant regulatory steps at this point and it makes too much. So what we're getting at is normally if you eat a fruit, that's a small amount of fructose, maybe about five grams, and there's a whole bunch of things to slow it down. The, the, the peel has to be removed. There's a lot of fiber in the fruit. There's other things about the fruit that are going to protect it from having any type of significantly negative effect. Okay, we'll talk about those more a little later. Um, you know, the fact it has vitamin C, the fruit has potassium, um, has magnesium. All of those things are going to help make fruits much, much different than eating high fructose corn syrup. Okay, but let's say you guzzle down soda pop and there's lots of high fructose corn syrup in there. And high fructose corn syrup, it can be like 65% uh, fructose and the rest glucose. Um, anyways, it will come into the liver and when it's phosphorylated, the phosphorylation process, because it keeps happening so rapidly, can lead to you know using up much of your ATP. And this ATP, that's you know the, the end product after you've given off a phosphate to phosphorylate the fructose, will then get metabolized into what is called uric acid. And that's real important because that uric acid gets released back into the blood and it's going to have major effects on our metabolism. Okay, also, all of this uh, end product of glycolysis comes into the liver and the liver has nothing to do with it. It's like, hey, I didn't order this. Why, don't you, why are you giving me all this pyruvate, all this acetyl-CoA? Let's just make it into fat. So this gets made into fat. So that's why eating processed food with a lot of high fructose corn syrup tends to produce a fatty liver. And fatty liver is super common. I would say the majority of Americans over 30 have a fatty liver. I see them all day long for incidental reasons. Patient comes for totally different reasons, but I somehow get a look at the liver and it's a fatty liver. That happens all the time. And fatty liver basically means diabetes of the liver. Okay, so you're pre-diabetic or diabetic if you got a fatty liver. Okay, um, so you need to know, this is real important, that a byproduct of fructose metabolism in the liver is to produce uric acid. And we're going to talk a lot more about that, and, and that's going to have a big deal. So they're getting fat, they're getting fatty liver that's predisposing them to worsening diabetes, and they're making lots of uric acid, which is going to make them hypertensive and cause some other problems. Okay, so just want to talk a little bit more about the, the group of doctors who sort of demonize fructose. And basically, you pretty much know if somebody's going to say that meat is good for you, they have to you know, come up with a scapegoat for why are people fat and sick. So they're going to say omega-6 cooking oils is what Chris Knob says, or they're going to say sugar is the main culprit. That's what Lustig says. Uh, Richard Johnson's going that way, and that's what David Perlmutter says. The other point I want to make, and that's what Dale Bredesen is. And he's, Dale Bredesen's not exactly this crew, but he is associated with these guys. Here, like I said, is Perlmutter made a big positive statement for his book. And the other thing, the reason I include the Shurzai book here is I was kind of surprised. They really demonize simple sugars. And in my recollection of the book is they said the number one reason people are so sick is excessive intake of simple sugars. Okay, that was their statement. All right, now if you read Perlmutter, Perlmutter is a neurologist and he's a pretty well-known guy. He's written books that are a bunch of bestsellers. And also, I made my point, in my opinion, okay, people might disagree with me, fine, but if you BS the public and you tell them something that all the corporations want you to say, all your books get made into bestsellers, you'll get thousands of reviews, you get invited everywhere. Perlmutter is the medical advisor for the Dr. Oz Show and for Men's Health, okay? And he says basically fructose is something that is used by animals to fatten up for the winter, like a bear fattening up for winter hibernation and the gaining the weight helps them to survive the winter. He says in the United States, the average blood level of uric acid, let's say around 1920 or something, was around 3.5, and now it's about 6. He says it's good to keep it at 5 or less. You can avoid your risk of gout by avoiding meats, alcohol, like beer in particular, um, eating fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup and excessive amounts of beans. Okay, so I just tell you that. So this is a, this is a big group of very famous doctors all talking about how terrible fructose is. All right, and here's a slide from one of the lectures of uh, Lustig. And Lustig's a real famous lecturer. Um, and what he's talking about here is that, if, you know, if you eat a fruit, things are kind of slowed down by the fiber and the other contents of the food. But if you eat, drink a soda pop, there is no fiber. You just get this quick bolus to the liver. And he felt that at least about 25% or more di diabetes worldwide is explained by sugar intake. Now, that's also a controversial statement because I can tell you from the research of uh, persons, uh, you know, that have studied diabetes for many years, sugar was not 
uh, really thought to cause diabetes, okay? And McDougall talks about this a lot. Sugar does not cause diabetes, all right? That's not what it does. It'll even increase your sensitivity. But we're going to get into a couple more details here, and there's a couple things that become quite interesting. This is a subject that people get pretty excited about, and it's a much more complicated subject than it seems at first. Why is it that so many of these fruitarians are really skinny? So this is Michael Arnstein. He's an ultra marathoner. And he's a fruitarian. He moved to Hawaii many years ago because he wanted, you know, to have easier access to fruit. One of the things I would make is a lot of these guys who are exercising a lot are the fruitarian types. And, you know, what is, where's the chicken and where's the egg? What comes first? And the point is they got tons of energy. You got a lot of energy if you can run a, you know, 50-mile, 100-mile race. And here's another famous uh, guy who eats tons of fruits. Durian Ryder. I mean, look how skinny these guys are. Look how skinny that guy is. He's as skinny as it gets. Um, and he says sugar is the best stimulant for your muscles and for your Johnson. And he talks all about how he's got increased energy to, to go. And there's other persons like Kip Chogi is that famous marathon runner. And he talks about, you know, putting lots of sugar into his iced tea drink. And he says that gives him more endurance to run his marathon race, for example. Freely, uh, Ryder's girlfriend used to be Freely the Banana Girl. And they would eat, you know, 30 bananas or more a day and still stay super thin. So obviously, you know, from personal experience, that doesn't seem to be making people that fat. You know, there's, you know that's certainly just an anecdotal example, but it is relevant. But then you're stuck with the question, well, then why does it make the bear fat for hibernation? All right, we're going to talk a little more about the biochemistry in a moment. Here is uh, Chris Knob again, the ophthalmologist who sort of believes that, you know, meats, you know, grass-fed, healthy, organic meats are healthy. Um, and he says vegetable oil is the big problem. And he's real smart. He went and reviewed tons of literature and epidemiology. And here's some of his slides that I thought were kind of interesting. So here he's talking about sugar and vegetable oil consumption versus the increasing incidence of diabetes in the United States. And the point he makes is that Americans have been eating a lot more sugar for a long time. And that curve has been relatively plateaued for a long time. But while that curve was plateaued, the incidence of diabetes just started going up, 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 and up. And the rising incidence of diabetes is parallel to the rising incidence of vegetable oils. So the point that Chris Knob makes is the correlation is tight with vegetable oils. And it is not tight, and even at times negative, related to sugar. So he doesn't think sugar has almost anything to do with the rise in diabetes and obesity. So here's another slide from Chris Knob, and that's what he's showing is here you've seen that um, the incidence of diabetes has rapidly gone up, and it's not related to the sugar curve. The sugar curve was, was horizontal and flat for all of this, so it has to be something else. And again, he's going to say he believes it is because of the omega-6 cooking oils. And the reason he says it's omega-6 cooking oils, he says you could almost superimpose the increase in obesity and diabetes curves with vegetable oils, but you can't do that with sugar. Okay, And what I would say is, you know, you're usually not going to get the answer all in one thing. There's a lot more estrogenic chemicals in the food supply and in the personal care products than there used to be. The estrogenic, estrogen is a fat storage hormone, so that's contributing to obesity. There's all these flavorants in the food like the MSG and um, the, that, and there's a lot more sodium in food. All those things can contribute to people gaining weight. You know, stuff tastes so good they get addicted to it. Okay, but this is a big statement here. Striking correlation to vegetable oils with obesity and diabetes increasing incidence, but no correlation or even a negative opposite directions with sugar. Okay, and then there's the other guys, the Japanese neuroscientist Tetsumori Yamashima, who brought out the point that, yeah, these vegetable oils are what he believed is making the Japanese people much, much sicker than they used to be and causing a lot of dementia and causing obesity and causing diabetes. Okay, just briefly on what omega-6 do. Um, they produce this toxic aldehyde, and the toxic aldehyde, and I'm going to find a place to hide here, um, is hydroxynonanol. So it's abbreviated HNE. Hydroxy, because it's got a hydroxy group on here. Non is NON for nine. There's nine carbons in it. Ene, because there's a double, a double bond in it. And AL, AL, because there's an aldehyde, meaning that there's a carbonyl group here with a double bond to oxygen and then just a, hy a hydrogen on there. That's an aldehyde. 
Okay, you can remember aldehyde and the H and hyde for the H group there. Okay, so anyways, hydroxynonanol also is an inhibitor of the mitochondrial, intermitochondrial membrane, in particular, it'll inhibit ATP synthase, where most of the ATP is made in your body. That's bad. Okay, and it causes lots of other problems. It'll destroy membranes through what is called lipid peroxidation chain reactions. So it's a toxic thing. It's toxic to mitochondria. It's toxic to your hypothalamus hunger center, the arcuate nucleus. It's toxic to your pancreas beta cells. So Tetsumura Yamashima, he's a world famous uh, Japanese neuroscientist guy, and he's written a bunch of papers on that. And that's also thought to explain why do the people from India have so much diabetes, despite being kind of thin, because he thinks hydroxynonanol is destroying their pancreases. Okay. Okay, so now here is uh, Chris Knob talking about uh, Japan, and he makes the same point in Japan. He says, look, where the obesity curve is going up, it's right parallel to the vegetable oils. And it does not make sense if you try to associate it with the sugar. So he thinks that's not the point. He says, yeah, there was some saturated fat, but relatively little, and that's not related to these two curves. So he's downplaying saturated fat, which you would expect him to do because he's going to be positive with regard to meats. Okay. But that's still, that's a pretty interesting set of curves. Obesity and diabetes are tracking with vegetable oils and not with the sugars. Okay, so just real quick going over the slide again. Glucose comes into the beginning of the cycle. It's tightly regulated at the PFK enzyme step. So nothing happens with glucose unless the liver wants to for good reason. Whereas fructose, when it comes in from, when it comes in from a fruit, why does, why does the fruit not make people fat? Well, first of all, there's a lot of fiber in the fruit. So that slows down the absorption. The intestinal enzymes have to peel that off slowly in your gut before the glucose is absorbed into your blood. Uh, the next thing is that there's not that much uh, fructose per serving. You know, one serving of fruit has about five grams of fructose. That's not that much overall. Um, the potassium, there's a lot of potassium in fruit, meaning they're vasodilators. So the vasodilator effects are going to counteract the vasoconstrictive effects of the uric acid. Okay, and the potassium is a vasodilator, the magnesium is a vasodilator. In addition, the vitamin C increases um, uric acid excretion from the body. So these things are going to enable uh, counteracting the effects of uric acid. But when it comes from high fructose corn syrup, there's nothing there to counteract these problems. And it'll come in as a big bolus because there's no fiber to slow it down. You just drink some liquid energy drink or something, all this high fructose corn syrup comes in, rapidly absorbed, goes to your liver, and the liver makes it into fat, fatty liver, and it makes tons of uric acid. So that's not good. Okay, now I'm going to go a little farther into what happens with the uh, uric acid. Just because when you hear this, everything will start making sense now. First of all, the uric acid goes into the blood. It inhibits enos. Enos means endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's what makes nitric oxide. You know, the vasodilator that Caldwell Esselstyn talks about all the time and Nathan Bryan talk about all the time. That's what dilates your small uh, arterioles and whatnot. And you need that to increase the blood supply to a tissue. And so to inhibit that, you then get a tightening of the, of the blood vessel. So that's called vasoconstriction, is to narrow the diameter of a blood vessel. And it's highly relevant because insulin normally will increase nitric oxide activity to vasodilate the muscles. The reason why it wants to vasodilate the muscle is you have to open up the capillaries so the insulin can get in there and cause those skeletal muscles to take up glucose after you've eaten a meal. So eating a meal is called prandial. Postprandial means after eating. And at that time, the glucose should be taken up into the muscles to be stored as glycogen. But because of the uric acid inhibiting endothelial nitric oxide, the insulin can't get you know, bound to the receptors on a lot of the skeletal muscle cells, so it can't activate enough skeletal muscle to take up glucose. And that's a problem, because that means the glucose doesn't have anywhere to go, and it stays high in the blood, and that will cause problems. But that's a key point. Uric acid inhibits endothelial nitric oxide production, leading to um, increased blood glucose, and this is a form of insulin resistance, meaning that insulin is not having its normal effect of being able to get the glucose into the skeletal muscle. Normally, the majority of your postprandial glucose is going to be stored in your skeletal muscles as um, you know, glycogen that can be used by the muscle later time when it exercises. The muscles are the biggest organ in your body. Okay, so that's a big deal. Increased insulin resistance means that eating large amounts of fructose, they do increase your risk of diabetes because you've got insulin resistance. That's what diabetes is all about, having insulin resistance. And blood glucose levels will go up. In addition, you say, well, why do they say it increases your risk of Alzheimer's? Well, 
the insulin levels in the blood go up. So you have high levels of insulin. It's hyperinsulinemia. And the high levels of insulin mean that you need more IDE as insulin degrading enzyme to clear the insulin out of the blood. Well, the insulin degrading enzyme also binds the beta amyloid protein. And uh, there's limited amounts of it can be produced. So when there's higher insulin level, tying up your insulin degrading enzyme and using it up, so to speak, then beta amyloid protein can accumulate in the brain. And there's some people, a lot of researchers actually, who think that's a major cause contributing to Alzheimer's dementia. Okay. Dementia is actually caused by more, a lot more things than just beta amyloid. But just to let you know, I'm giving you like one logical pathway how this idea of eating a lot of fructose, high fructose corn syrup, can contribute to cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Also, the excessive fatty liver leads to liver releasing fat into the blood. Very low density lipoproteins and triglycerides in the blood. And so that's bad to have those elevated in the blood. Also, the uric acid causes some stimulation of SANS. SANS is sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And that will contribute to causing hypertension. The uric acid also sticks the red blood cells together. It overcomes the zeta potential, the negative charge on the outer surface of red blood cells. And because of that, it'll stick them together like blood sludge or low formation. And that makes the blood thicker, like a milkshake instead of like water. So the point being is when the blood is thick, blood pressure goes up. So you get hypertension. That's a big deal. We've already seen here. So uric acid is contributing to hypertension, increased blood pressure. Well, that's associated with atherosclerosis. The number one risk factor for atherosclerosis and silent strokes is hypertension. So uric acid is contributing to that. And then we also just a moment ago talked about uric acid causing insulin resistance to diabetes. And the two main risk factors for, well, the three main risk factors for um, dementia are aging, diabetes, and hypertension. So uric acid is contributing there to insulin resistance and diabetes and to hypertension. So you can see there's a mechanism whereby it would increase the risk of dementia. It also causes some platelet aggregation over here, increasing the likelihood of platelets to stick together, to clot. So you're now seeing all of stuff that you don't want. The blood's becoming, moving towards becoming hypercoagulable, also because you got all this fat in the blood from the fatty liver, and now you got insulin resistance. That's going to cause all kinds of problems like increased advanced glycation products in the liver. I've talked about all that stuff in separate lectures on diabetes. But you can see everything is going in a bad direction when you get excessive amounts of uric acid, not to mention gout. People mostly think of gout, but there's a lot of other things that uric acid does besides that. Okay, classic insulin function and resistance. Let's just briefly talk about that. So normally, insulin binds a receptor on the cell surface. Here's the plasma membrane of a cell, let's say a skeletal muscle cell, for example. It activates this receptor. The receptor causes this vesicle within the cytoplasm containing these blue things here. These blue things are called glucose type 4 transporters. And it sends a message to them that they should move up to the plasma membrane of the cell. And so this vesicle will merge with the plasma membrane and these um, transport channels for the glucose will then merge into the plasma membrane and will allow glucose to come into the cell. And so that's a normal situation. Insulin interacting with the skeletal muscle, uh, insulin receptor leading to increased glucose uptake into the skeletal muscle. That's a normal postprandial thing to happen after eating a meal. Okay, one problem though is if you eat excessive amounts of fats, especially saturated fat, but in general you're eating excessive amounts of fats, you'll tend to get what is called insulin resistance due to overnutrition. These, especially sad fats, but the fats in general, they're going to send too many electron carriers to the mitochondria, and that can overwhelm the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, with too many electron carriers too suddenly and it'll start to leak some electrons, like it'll leak an electron off of coenzyme Q right here, so to speak, and you can form these free radicals called superoxide anions, meaning that the oxygen can, instead of getting four electrons like it needs to be converted to water, it's only getting one electron here and it becomes a superoxide. All right, and that can lead to oxidative stress and other problems. But the point I wanted to make is excessive dietary fat is the most common risk factor for insulin resistance, and that, that's important to know causes electron transport to run backwards. It's a problem in the cell. Once the cell senses overnutrition, like say from excess fat, it sends a signal to the plasma membrane here to call it overnutrition signal to, hey, ignore the insulin binding. We are overwhelmed with uh, nutrition. We cannot take in any more uh, nutrients, no more glucose. Uh, we're just loaded up to the gills, okay? So that's how excessive uh, dietary fat causes insulin resistance. And now these glucose type 4 transporters will not merge with the plasma membrane, so glucose will not come into the cell. I drew this area to show them sort of bouncing off the plasma membrane, if you will. So that's insulin resistance. That's super important. 
Um, all right, so now a couple points more about uh, dietary fructose. So fructose does not satisfy hunger. And part of how it's metabolized in the liver is that you don't get satisfaction of hunger as quickly as you would if you were eating a starch. For example, I know my experience, let's say I'm eating apples, I'll real quickly eat five and I'll eat 10. They don't satisfy my hunger, okay? And this goes through all the different you know, hormonal issues associated with that. Fructose promotes fatty liver. Okay, these are just some papers on it if you want to see them. Uh, fructose, oh, fructose uh, also, what was I going to say? Fructose caused fatty liver, increased blood cholesterol, increased insulin resistance. It doesn't, it doesn't satisfy hunger in the same way, and that's why you can overeat a lot with uh, these sweetened processed foods especially. And high fructose corn syrup, they can specially make it so 65% fructose. That's a very high amount of fructose. It also often would have mercury in it because of the way it was purified, and that's not good too. They would even advertise it as being a preservative. Okay, um, endothelial cell. Most important thing to know about endothelial cells, the lining cells of your arteries, that they make nitric oxide, which is a gas, and it goes into the blood and makes the platelets less likely to clot. So it prevents clotting, that's good. And it also diffuses back into the arterial wall to the vascular smooth muscle and causes them to relax, to vasodilate. So that's what you want. But the uric acid is gonna inhibit this endothelial nitric oxide. So you're gonna be more prone to clotting and your muscles, your, and the vascular smooth muscles won't relax. So you'll have a narrowed vasoconstricted arteries and that will raise your blood pressure. Okay, and then here's the point we made earlier about the Dietary fructose causing increased uric acid, the uric acid inhibiting enos, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, meaning you're not going to make that nitric oxide, meaning you can't vasodilate the arterioles in your skeletal muscle, meaning that the insulin can't get to the muscle cells, which means that they can't take up that glucose. And so it's a, it's a different mechanism of causing um, insulin resistance. And so now glucose will remain high in the blood and cause all these secondary complications. Okay, hypertension, activate SANS, okay, fine. All right, now I'm gonna go into a little more detail. So it's the same thing, but same slide with a couple little pieces of additional information. So we talked about how the uric acid elevation is gonna to lead to more diabetes, it's gonna to lead to more hypertension. It also causes more sodium reabsorption in the gut, and it causes more sodium retention from the kidneys. So it very much uh, does a lot of things to cause more hypertension. So hypertension is a big manifestation of it. And you think about it, most of these patients, they all have the same diseases. They're diabetic and they're hypertensive. And your gout patients are typically you know, diabetic and hypertensive. Um, we talked about how high insulin levels in the blood, hyperinsulinemia, uses up insulin degrading enzyme and that lets more beta amyloid protein accumulate. So here's three major ways that it can contribute to uh, causing dementia, lack of oxygen uh, delivery to the cells of your brain. We talk about how it's pro-thrombotic, it's obesogenic, that stuff's all bad. But again, I would make the point, there's a big difference between eating fruits and eating um, you know, processed food with lots of uh, high fructose corn syrup and no fiber. So that's much worse, certainly. Um, and you know, a lot of these people are eating fruits, it's because they're also exercising a tremendous amount. They're real high energy physical, physical fitness persons. And so McDougall recommends you don't eat too much fruit. He says eat starch. Starch is a polymer of glucose. That's what your body wants. That's what keeps you healthy. That makes you skinny. And that you got to be careful because of this tendency for the fruits to taste so good and the, for them not to satisfy hunger initially that a person can really overeat a lot and that can potentially cause them to gain weight. Okay. Uh, so anyways, um, now again, if you're an athlete for a pre-workout meal, also Ruth Hydrich, the great uh, survivor of metastatic cancer, wonderful lady, and also, um, you know, triathlete, marathoner. You know, you ask her, what does she eat? She loves eating fruits, and she also would eat a lot of fruits, she says, when she would have a pre-workout meal, even though usually her races were early in the morning, so she would just eat the night before. But, so I basically think fruits are still pretty good. You do have to be careful sometimes. Also, what happens, too, is they, I think they they somehow modify these apples that they just taste too good. Because I know when I was a kid, I wouldn't eat, you know, 10, 12 apples in a row. I actually quit eating apples, though, because I think they put that coating on it now, the same one they put on avocados that I want to avoid. Um, you know what that is, AP, and then I'm going to just put hyphen, 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 L. We'll leave it at that. You can figure out what it is if you've seen my previous videos on it. 
But so anyways, I still eat a lot of fruit, about 30 to 40% of my calories. I could probably eat less, but I still exercise a pretty good amount, even though I also do a lot of uh, just, you know, basic office work. Uh, so anyways, I, I hope that was interesting to you, explaining the mechanisms of it. And I do think that the truth is excessive amounts of fructose certainly will make you fat. Omega-6 cooking oils certainly will make you fat. So will all these estrogenic chemicals. So will the saturated fat and meat. Um, so will making stuff hyper palatable. So you eat more of these junk foods with all the sodium in the MSG. So um, anyways, hope that was helpful.